Um, yeah. Yeah. organizers of today's event. I want to thank some other organizers, my good friend Sean Drexler. Thank you, Sean. This event is a very broad event that comprises multiple coalition parts. Oh. And it would not be possible without their support or active engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Today. today is a solemn day. 78 years ago today. 78 years ago today, the United States bombed the city of Hiroshima, killing 80,000 people instantly, mostly civilians. Another 40,000 people died as a result of radiation poisoning. 120,000 people. Mostly civilians. Excuse me. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so 120,000 people, mostly civilians, died 78 years ago when the United States. Three days later, they did it again to the people of Nagasaki. Today, we honor their memory. No nukes. Cut the military war machine and move money to the people's needs. Thank you for coming. We have about four speakers and then we'll wrap up for the afternoon. So yes, thank you for coming out and supporting this today. It's great. Um, as he said, no nukes. The doomsday clock is at 90 seconds to midnight. This is a really bad time. So uh, with that said, I'd like to Hello, hello. First speaker, and that's uh, Rachel Brunke. Uh, Rachel is active with uh, Code Pink, started at the LA Harbor Peace Week to combat mil the military's LA Fleet Week, and was a candidate for California State Assembly in 2018 with the Green Party. She teaches high school students whose values, dreams, and energy inspires her daily. She lives with her partner and daughter on an urban farm. Rachel? First of all, I just want to say respect to 
the people who have been, who are here, whose lives and cultures and maybe countries of origins have been directly impacted by the nuclear war machine in the world. As I was doing some research today to talk about the environmental effects of nuclear weapons, country after country, area after area of the United States, all around this planet, we have been toxifying our world for the last 80, 85 years in the name of blowing up the world in the last 80 or 85 years. The United States, I am a teacher, I'm a high school teacher, so my point of reference, and a mom, my point of reference is children and young people. As we were marching down here, beautiful, beautiful, solemn procession down the pier, a group of kind of the typical macho looking, I'm just gonna say white male Americans, looked at our signs and one of them said to the others, they're anti-American, at which point I lost it. <laughs> Because I said, all children want peace. You are anti-child. You are anti-family. You are anti-woman and man who wants peace. So we can hold no quarter for that fascist mentality that has gotten us to the point where we are. Where we are doomsday clock of a matter of seconds away from total annihilation. And, you know, yeah, we can have a beautiful surf event on the beach. And that's a beautiful thing. But... You know, when this all ends, they're going to be looking for us, and what are we going to say? We told you so, and we don't want to be in that position. Right now, as my students are suffering um, with lack of opportunity in the future, we are spending 28 times more just on the military-industrial complex than we are on climate change. They don't want to go from high school into war. They want to go to high school into peace, and we are not giving them that opportunity. The Defense Department alone burns 80% of all the fuel that the U.S. government burns. 80% of it is just for war. If we took 1% of this year's military budget, we could create 140,000 green jobs for young people looking to save the planet, looking to save their communities and help their families. The U.S. military has over 750 bases around the world, as many of us know. And if you think about it, all those bases and all those installations require uh, buildings. We have over half a million buildings around the world just dedicated to our war. That's just the U.S. war machine. And imagine... Um, my husband was at an event recently about procurement for military bases around the world. Plumbers, construction workers, electricians, all of the things that we think of as trade are so much actually around the world used for trade for military purposes. So we can't just say that people who directly work in the military industrial complex are at fault. We have to see that that much of our industry, industrial base, is also um, uh, you know, part of the nuclear war machine. If we continue to mine for uranium, that mining, that uranium waste leaches into the waste, the water, into the soil, and by terms of dust, into the air. The production of nuclear weapons, if there's a fire, if there's an explosion at a production site, all of that nuclear waste has been for decades circling the globe in our global atmosphere. The testing, we test underground, we test underwater, we test above ground. The fallout just from the 1960s testing and Chernobyl has contaminated forever the lichens on the rocks globally that all reindeer and caribou eat. So the people in the most northern latitudes of the world are eating caribou who have radiation poisoning from 50 years ago. We talk for the last 30, 40 years about nuclear winter. If we explode even 10% of our global stockpile of weapons, that would be like 100 Hiroshima's. 
and five billion kilos of soot would blow into the atmosphere and block out the sun, blocking out agriculture. As I looked at that fact and wrote that fact, I thought of many Americans who will be so stupid, they'll go, well, I don't eat plants, I prefer meat. Well, guess what your meat eats? We are such an uneducated, stupid people, ready to annihilate the world, that we need to start showing the facts against such willful ignorance. Willful ignorance. And lastly, climate change, climate change, climate change. All of the nuclear waste being held around the world in these sites are vulnerable to extreme weather events. Oh, well, there's always been hurricanes, there's always been floods. The difference is people, and I think this summer is like the nail in the coffin, no one can argue this, is yeah, the earth used to have 1% of its surface area at any time undergoing an extreme weather event. It now has 10% of the Earth's surface at any given moment undergoing an extreme weather event. These nuclear stockpiles are in the direct line of floods and hurricanes and fires. We must sign the treaty uh, against the proliferation of nuclear weapons and we must provide assistance to the victims already, the Native Americans, the people throughout the, the Pacific Islands, um, uh, of course, Japan and on uh, from our nuclear weapons. So sign the treaties now, abolish nuclear weapons and reparations for the harm already done. Do you think the youth want that? Oh. You bet. The youth want, the youth want solution. Help them and help us move forward and push these warmongers off the cliff. Thank you. Hi, right, me again. <laughs> uh, next, we're going to have um, Grace Nakatihala. Uh, she's an author. Grace was interned and imprisoned as a child and will tell her story about being a survivor as she knows it. She lives in Cerritos and worked as an educator in the ABC School District. Grace? Station. When she was getting close to the police station, 
she saw bodies strewn all over the parking lot. The stench, the smell of burned bodies. This was so horrific. She had nightmares for years and years. Also, sirens would go off. And from the uh, parking lot, the, these individuals, these bodies, men, no legs, no arms, half their faces gone, would crawl, try to crawl, literally, to the shelter. Survival is the ultimate desire to live in their darkest moment. We endured Nagasaki, our family, when our lineage was cut down and killed. My cousins were enrolled in the University of Nagasaki. When the bomb hit three days after Hiroshima, their lives were taken. We were told to never speak of this devastation. <laughs> the loss was so unbearable. I'm here today to remind us death occurred. We must emphasize lives lost. There are no winners. My faith and hope must be restored and for our belief this will not happen and never be forgotten. So I leave you with a thank you for having us here. Thank you. Uh, Pacific Asian nuclear free pizza. Uh, Chikuro was born, was born in Nagasaki and he graduated from a high school in Hiroshima. The 300 members from their school were killed and virtually everyone was affected by the bombing. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. And a part of my speech like, really repeats the uh, introduction that I got, so I apologize in advance, but so, um, you know, as everyone has been saying, 78 years ago, the first A-bombs were dropped over the skies of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, you know, they killed more than 200,000 people in a matter of four months. And, uh, and caused intergenerational traumas. So I'm here today because I'm a graduate of a high school in Hiroshima where 350 young lives were decimated on August 6, 1945. And uh, almost every you know, classmate of mine had someone in their family who was directly affected by the A-bomb. So out of over 200,000 casualties of the A-bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, an estimated 10% were Korean people who were forced to, um, you know, forcibly uh, taken to Japan to be forced laborers. And that's a part of the history that should not be forgotten. And I have my Korean friends here today and I thank them for showing up. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I like to say every year, August 6, 1945 was a hot summer day. Just like today, but okay, here today is kind of overcast. But just imagine, it was a clear sky. And that made a tragedy uh, really, you know, much, much worse because they had a clear visibility over the sky of Hiroshima. Um, so at 8.15 a.m., that was when the bomb exploded over the sky of Hiroshima and the people were just starting their day. So please know that the girls that my, you know, uh, at my high school, they were just like your kids and your grandkids. The air raid warnings were going on and off all night, you know, uh, and 
the air raid warning, you know, so when the air raid warning was called off that morning, these girls were disappointed. You know why? Because they had to go to school now. Because they uh, sustained air raid warnings meant no school or no work, actually. But since the air raid warning was called off just before the A-bomb was dropped, uh, they had to go to school. So they were very, very disappointed. So uh, I say that to illustrate the point that they were just like the girls here. Um, so they were just like girls that you know in your life. During the wartime, fashion was something to be frowned upon. Um, and there was no resources really available in Japan at that time to be fashionable. But you know, these girls found a way to be fashionable in their own way. They managed to find a, a colorful fabric and they, 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 sold, they sewn this fabric inside their clothes. And that was their fashion statement. Um, so that morning, when they saw the B-29, the American airplane, you know, warplane, when they saw the airplanes in the sky, many of them described them as beautiful. And they dropped the bomb. The people of Hiroshima experienced the loss of humanity that day. Not only the bombing itself was inhumane, but what they have seen and what they experienced was beyond our imagination. And, um, yeah, so, you know, and, and that caused a deep moral injury. So that day, most of the survivors, you know, had to leave someone to die. And that someone, you know, might have been their neighbors, uh, their family members, their friends, their, um, you know, their siblings. Many of them were trapped under the collapsed building and they were screaming for help. But they had to save themselves too. So they had to tell these people that, I'm sorry, I can't help you and run away and left them to be burnt alive. So that's a, a drawing by the survivor that tells the story. So that happened to so many people, probably virtually everyone, every one of the survivors. So many had to live with the guilt of abandoning someone that day. Nuclear atrocities neither began nor ended with Hiroshima and Nagasaki though. That we have to remember. So the people, the indigenous people of this land have been affected by uranium mining and nuclear testing. You know, things like that. And you, you know, we don't have to look very far. Uh, in the Hunters, uh, Bayview Hunters Point neighborhood of San Francisco, that area has been uh, heavily contaminated because of the presence of US military uh, radio, radiology uh, laboratory. Um, and the people are seeking justice even today. In the 90s, the San Francisco Bay had the highest incident rates of the uh, uh, invasive uh, breast cancer in the world, highest in the world. Um, and that never, that, that's never talked about, right? So we have to remember there are victims of nuclear atrocities all over the world, not only Nagasaki and uh, Hiroshima. So give back the human. The Hiroshima poet, Toge Sankichi, cries out in his powerful and famous poem. No more sacrifices. That should be our battle call. No more sacrifices. We are not sacrificing others anymore and we are not allowing ourselves to be sacrifices. We are fighting, you know, when we, when we advocate for things like nuclear free world and no war, we are fighting to save our own humanity. And also we are fighting to preserve our own dignity as human beings. Lastly, I'm compelled to call attention to TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, and the government of Japan's planned dumping of radioactive wastewater from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean, right? Into the Pacific Ocean. So um, we are standing here today on the beautiful beach 
that's enjoyed by families and suffers. There are harmful radioactive nuclides in the water, uh, such as tritium, that once it gets inside your body, it causes cell damage and damage to your DNA. Um, so this is, you know, another form of nuclear atrocity, and that should not allow to happen. So no more Hiroshima's, no more Nagasaki's, no more Fukushima's, and no more sacrifices. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's, yes, really sad. Along with all that nuclear stuff, we're eating plastic in, in the oceans. We're, 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 I, I wrote the other day, greed continues to be the driving factor across the globe, even in the face of our own demise. Sad. Um, so our next speaker will be Sam Coleman, I can pronounce that well. Lecturer of Japanese Language Culture at CSE. ULB. Sam has a PhD in Anthropology and East Asian Studies, awarded by the Columbia University in 1987. Yes, he's a little bit old. His 1999 book, Japanese Science from the Inside, is one of the Nippon, Nippon Foundation's 100 recommended books for understanding modern Japan. Sam, jo Sam joined a Japanese family when he married a Japanese language specialist colleague 40 years ago. Their two sons live and work in Tokyo. Sam, thank you. Uh, I'm so honored to be here. I'm so honored, uh, having invited myself, that folks accepted my talk. These are really remarkable people, and I hope you get to know all of them better. I've been a Veteran Peace uh, Associate Member for 20 years now. Want me to talk louder? Okay, I'll do my best. Now, if you are a secondary school teacher, or if you are a university level instructor, I want to invite you to join me in a project. We're going to write educational materials for curricula about Japan and nuclear weapons. And this is going to be under the auspices of Veterans for Peace with help from Becky Looney, a wonderful editor. She doesn't know it yet, but I'm going to talk her into it. Uh, I'm also available to talk with you if you've got a religious group or civic group uh, about Japan, nuclear weapons, war, the whole thing. Um, I don't charge a speaker's fee or honorarium, but I really do like a good carrot cake. Uh, so now I've set myself Mission Impossible to explain to you in under five minutes why we didn't need to drop those atomic bombs on Japan. <laughs> Mission impossible. I could spend three hours on it easily. But I'll say this, I'll give you one or two goodies, and I'll point you in the direction where there's some reasonably good authoritative information. And these days, folks, that's so important. I mean, I spend half of my class time fighting internet-based crap. Okay, because everybody is choosing their own facts these days. A name to remember is John Dower, D-O-W-E-R. Magnificent human being and knows more about Japan than almost anybody else. He's an emeritus professor of history at MIT. And I'm basing much of what I know on what I've learned from him. Okay, so let me just lay out a sample because I, I know I only have a few minutes. Uh, we have to take apart these various myths and half-truths brick by brick. So I'm going to pull out one brick, okay? We had to drop the bomb because the Japanese wouldn't surrender. And that's what you can get from the movie Oppenheimer. That's what they said. Now, despite some faults, that, by the way, is a terrific movie, and we're going to make a lot of use of it, okay? It's a great opportunity. And the hell of it is, those people in America's top leadership at that time were believing it. Now, What's the reality? Well, it seems that there was something that was called the Office of War Information. Let me get this just right, okay. Um, Forum Morale and Analysis Division, OWI, FMAD. They were really interesting people. They were psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists. Ruth Benedict was one of them. 
most famous anthropologists uh, yeah, of the time. Yeah, yeah. What were they doing? They were getting information from wherever they could. Uh, interviews with captured Japanese soldiers, diaries, letters back home, okay? And I want to say, getting the information from the soldiers was kind of bad, you know, it was difficult to do. Because American commanders were telling our soldiers to kill everybody. Don't take any prisoners. Okay? Now, cross-reference that. Next time you hear, oh, those Japanese just wouldn't surrender. Well, what happened if they tried? Okay? So what these people came up with is that uh, by April or so of 1944, I want to get this right, okay? Uh, morale was really bad. If you pitch your propaganda right, they will surrender. We were doing it in Germany. Why don't we do it in Japan? Well, the, the leadership of the American military said, oh, we can't reason with them. And you'll always get that. Before you kill people, what you say is we can't reason with them. Okay? There's a big danger sign for you. Uh, and morale among civilians was really low, too. So, on that front alone, when anybody tells you, well, they just wouldn't surrender, you go, wait a minute, hey, we've got some empirical evidence by very, very well-educated, authoritative people to say otherwise. So, let me wrap this up. Why is it that we're talking about something that happened 78 years ago, okay? Well, there's a great quote from a Faulkner book. Uh, the past isn't dead. It isn't even past. I just learned a really neat word, prefigurative, okay? Uh, prefigurative means that you're going to base what you do upon arguments from the past. And to say that we had to kill a huge civilian population means that we're putting together a list of reasons, some of them fictitious, some of them half true, because it means we're ready to do it again. So that's why for all of you, discussion of why that happened is essential to the total picture of making sure it never happens again. Thanks so much, everybody. Okay, so, um, yes, uh, Veterans for Peace is the host on this day, and Veterans for Peace statement of purpose is that uh, we as military veterans do hereby affirm our greater responsibility to serve the cause of world peace. So to this end, we will work with others both, both nationally and internationally, thank you all for coming, to increase public awareness of the causes and costs of war, to restrain our governments from intervening overtly and covertly in the internal affairs of other nations. We resist racism and repression in our home communities to oppose the militarization of our law enforcement and to end arms race and to reduce the eventual and eventually eliminate nuclear weapons. To seek justice for veterans and victims of war. To abolish war as an instrument of national policy. I mean, that's our main industry, and that's horrible. We should, do, we should be able to do better. So to achieve these goals, members of Veterans for Peace pledge to use nonviolent means and to maintain an organization that is both democratic and open with the understanding that all members are trusted to act in the best interest of the group for the larger purpose of world peace. And so uh, I'm going to pass it over, and this gentleman is going to explain the meaning behind the uh, these creams that you see. Brian. Thank you. Again, thank you for coming today. Thank you for remembering the victims. Here we have paper cranes that were carefully made in, in, in honor of the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These cranes will be sent to Hiroshima to hang in a display to honor the victims. If you would like to take home with you a paper crane today, please visit this table, pick up some literature. There's paper cranes available that you can take. 
There's also some flyers if you don't already have one. There's some sign-up sheets and petitions on how to keep connected with the group that put this together. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. No nukes, cut the military budget, and fund the people's needs. Peace.